What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? And why did Jesus call that sin unforgivable? Is the Holy Spirit a he or something else? Should we pray to the Holy Spirit by name, or should we follow Jesus' example and only pray to the Father? In my interview today, Professor Fred Sanders answers these questions and more about the Holy Spirit. Fred serves as Professor of Theology at the Tory Honors Institute at Biola University and is the author of a number of books including The Holy Spirit, An Introduction, which is part of Crossway's Short Studies in Systematic Theology series. Let's get started. Well, Fred, thanks so much for joining me again on the Crossway Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, it's fun. We've uh, discussed the Trinity in a previous episode a couple years ago now, and today we're going to dig into the Holy Spirit. First question that I think might strike some as a silly question, perhaps, or a uh, weird question, but I I actually think, I've heard people say this, it's a question that uh, a lot of average normal Christians would actually have at some point and would wonder how to answer Uh, Is the Holy Spirit a he, a she, an it, or something else? How should we refer to the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. And this is a, I think this is an area where you can trust your English Bible translation and go with he. Hmm. Um, So that for most people, that's kind of a common sense. Oh, good. I sort of felt like I should call the Spirit he anyway. That's probably the default. But but then we read, you know, uh, certain books that present the Holy Spirit a certain way or, or even just want to preserve the fact that he doesn't have a gender like Jesus does. Right. And so we, then we think, is it it, perhaps? Yep, yep. That's, um, so, so much of this is determined by sort of the context from which you're coming to the question. Mm. Um, and if I could just mention two contexts in my own upbringing, I grew up uh, Pentecostal um, in the Foursquare Church. And if in those settings you referred to the Holy Spirit as it, that was a dead giveaway that you were not born again. Mm. <laughs> like yeah. anyone who doesn't yeah. know that the Holy Spirit is someone personal a person and dares to say it yeah. uh, has yeah. obviously blown it and we need to help that person right away mm. come to an experiential understanding right. of this somebody. There's like a theological significance to that yeah. mistake. Yeah, yep. Um, but then, of course, I went off to grad school, which uh, I was in the city of Berkeley for that. And there you have more of these other concerns that you've raised about like, mm. Yeah, you used a personal pronoun, but you used a gendered personal pronoun. Mm -hmm. So are you saying that the Holy Spirit is male? Well, and the interesting thing there is the Son, incarnate as Jesus, has an actual literal physical gender to him. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that makes some sense why we call the Son a he and Jesus a he. The Father is presented as Father in the scriptures very explicitly. So the he then makes sense there. But the Spirit is a little less obvious in scripture. I think that's right, and I have learned over the years that the, in places where the Holy Spirit is less obvious, less clear, less concrete, where he talks about himself that way, where mm. the Bible describes him that way, that can strike us as an irritation. Like, I wish the Spirit <laughs> would behave clearly yeah. <laughs> the, like the other two persons of the Trinity. But you've got to push through that and get to, God's revelation is perfect, so this must be you know, a feature, not a bug, Mm. as programmers would say. This must be actually, the ambiguity must be something good. And I think if I were to say what's good about the ambiguity in this case, it would be that it reminds you that in no case, neither with the Father, nor the Eternal Son, nor the Spirit, are you in fact talking about maleness, Mm. right? So then what is the significance of the fact that the Scripture does, though, use that pronoun he in reference to all of those persons? Yeah. You know, it's... In, in the cultures of Scripture, we're talking about uh, you don't have a non-gendered way of talking about personal agency, and so that's the default. Uh, I want to jump into that broader issue there you talked about of the, the ambiguity or the lack of some clarity at times when it comes to the Spirit. Um, of all the persons of the Trinity, it seems like the Spirit's role and function in salvation history and in our own lives, even as Christians— often feels, at least to many Christians, to be the most opaque. Mm. And you have, I think, an interesting take on that. How would you reflect on that fact? Yeah, if you push through and get to why that's an advantage instead of a disadvantage. Because mm. right? that'd, be, that'd be one way you'd kind of push against perhaps the, 
the kind of easy critique of say evangelical Christians that we kind of don't know the spirit. We should know the spirit more. Right. You don't see that as a wholly bad thing. That's right. Some people should know more about the spirit and should even talk more about the spirit, Mm -hmm. but not everybody should. Some people are actually living fine, functioning, flourishing Christian lives in touch with biblical revelation and, you know, really pursuing knowledge of God and are talking about the spirit in the same proportion that scripture talks about the spirit, mm. right? Yeah. which you can't really say that's a C minus that like they must be doing it right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unpack that. So how would you describe how scripture talks about the spirit? Yeah. Well, I think the spirit talks, uh, the, the, well, it is the spirit, right? <laughs> the spirit. Cause that's <laughs> the uh, divine author of scripture. Um, scripture talks about the Holy spirit less than the father and son, less concretely than the father and the son. And, later than the Father and the Son. Mm. That is to say, the scriptural pattern is to build a foundation of talking about the Father and the Son, and then to add to that discussion of the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the trick with that, and I can give examples of that. Um, Broadly, the structure of Romans is kind of a lot about the Father, and then a lot about the Son, and the Spirit is mentioned a few times, but then in chapter 8 just comes on and takes over, right? Maybe even more clearly, John's Gospel, which is, you know, the greatest one thing to read on the doctrine of the Trinity— John's gospel starts with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word right. was God. Yeah. And it's this dyadic, there are two terms there, the Word and God, and you go round and round that circle, and John instructs you on in how to think about that. Then the story starts, and it's all about the Father and the Son, the Father and the Son, the Father and the Son. A few references to the Spirit, but not really until around chapter 14, the Holy Spirit really comes to the foreground of mm. Jesus' teaching, partly because by John 14... Jesus is already thinking about going away to the Father yeah. and not abandoning us, but sending us another comforter. So is, is there a sense in which the Spirit's role in salvation history really comes to the fore after the Son leaves the earth? Yes, yeah. So Jesus is a helper, which we know because he says he will send another helper. Um, of course, the Spirit's work comes to the fore there because it's then working on the foundation of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Mm. The Spirit has always been everywhere doing anything God does. But the work of the Spirit, just like the Son of God, has always been everywhere doing everything. Mm. But the incarnation is special, Mm. right? Similarly, on the basis of the finished work of the incarnate Christ, the Spirit is present in a new and special way. Let's dig into that then right there as well. I think we know that the Holy Spirit is active in the New Testament, in the the writings of the New Testament. We see him very clearly there, even if it isn't as common as often as we hear of the Father and the Son. But sometimes I think Christians wonder about his presence and activity in the Old Testament before Christ's coming. It feels much less clear, I think, to most of us uh, than it does in the New. So Mm. speak to that a little bit. We have our systematic category that yes he has always been there he's always been active but right. where do we do we actually see him in the old testament or is is that just sort of something we have to assume was going yeah. on i mean this is a huge and great topic we do see the spirit of god in the old testament you notice i didn't call him the holy spirit mm. because the old testament doesn't put that adjective in front of that noun very often to pick out mm what we would call, I'll, I'll just say it anachronistically, the third person of the Trinity, yeah. clearly not an Old Testament way of talking. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but the noun, the adjective holy in front of the noun spirit is only like twice in Isaiah and once in Psalm 51. Mm. Um, and in the case of Psalm 51, it's not very clear that it doesn't just mean the spirit of God's holiness, you know, because yeah. it's a repentant psalm. Yeah, right, um, right. It's not, not clearly a different person than yeah. the Father. The Isaiah passage is clearer i think because it's about it's god is speaking in the first person there and saying i will be with you my own presence was with you and then it talks about the sending of the holy spirit Mm. um so it's clearly like divine identity but some mode of god's you know presence it doesn't quite say another person yeah again that's not an old testament way of talking so so would you say that we could get a fully orbed trinitarian theology including the holy spirit as a distinct person from the old testament itself or do we Do we need the New Testament revelation to actually help us understand that? I think we, I think we need the New Testament revelation in order to understand it. I always appeal to what B.B. Warfield said about the Old Testament, which is that it's a, it's a chamber richly furnished, but dimly lit. Mm. Um, Of course, you don't just have the Old Testament by itself. You have it with the New Testament and the New Testament is the light, which 
yeah. then shines back onto the Old Testament. So what I like about Warfield's thing is the furniture is all there in the Old Testament, the, the, but the lights aren't on. Yeah, but once you turn the lights on, you can see that, oh, yeah. wow, yeah, this was this is supported. Yep, yeah. yep. This is, I think, especially nice with the Holy Spirit because um, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of... You know, there are all these different spirit phrases. The, yeah. the word spirit is definitely an Old Testament word. Yeah. Um, becomes the name that is specifically picking out this person, which then in retrospect, you look back on the Old Testament and say, oh, the spirit of God on the face of the waters and the spirit of the Lord and my spirit that I will send out. These are not, there aren't 19 spirits. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> these are all unitively pointing to the person who gets the new covenant name the Holy Spirit. Mm, it's yeah. not an old covenant name. Yeah. 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 So if you were talking, just to take a step back a little bit, if you're talking to a seven-year-old, say a small child, uh, how would you answer the simple question, who is the Holy Spirit and what does he do? Yep. I would, uh, I'd be laying down, you know, a, a foundation here for catechesis and mm. <laughs> knowing that a, a kid that age is going to understand something yeah. at the moment yeah. and is going to memorize some words and, and, yeah. begin to infer some connections yeah. and you can build on it later. So, so one point then in saying that is just that you, you know, it's, you can't think in terms of a single concise definition and, and I think that's kind of sufficient. Yeah, that's right. I mean, when you're talking about communicating with young people, it's a, it's a process. Um, but, yeah. then, but then communicating this, this, something about the Trinity is, is a process. Yep. Yep. So I would actually say the Holy Spirit is God, the third person of the Trinity. Hmm. Um, and obviously they're not, you know, they're not going to take all that in right yeah. now, but they've got hooks now out. in their mind to say like, oh, yeah. right. You know, we keep talking at church and I keep reading in the Bible yeah. about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So yeah. then how would you summarize what this Holy Spirit does? When I start unpacking this sort of in a catechetical way, you know, when I can, es- by which I mean when I can establish the categories um, from Scripture, you know, mm. from Scripture, but arranged systematically in such a way that this is going to provide advanced organizers into which... Christian understanding can grow yeah. as it matures. Um, I'm going to talk about the life of God always being, in all things, from the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. Mm. And I'm going to try to not talk too much about the Father and the Son here yeah, and say that in the Spirit part really has the force of meaning completed in the Spirit, reaching its fulfillment in the Spirit, being perfected in the Spirit. Mm. That everything God does, God does from the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. So let's, let's briefly unpack each of those prepositions that you're using, distinct with each person. We, we talked about some of this in our last conversation about the Trinity as a whole, mm. but I think it's helpful to you know, summarize some of that same ground as we, as we then zero in on the Spirit more. Uh, so what does it mean to talk about things being from the Father? It means that in the life of the Trinity, um, the Father is the source of everything. Uh, we see that... <laughs> One of the rules is you can't talk about a particular person of the Trinity if all you talk about is the divine essence. If, if you're going to say like, you know, you know, the almighty one. Oh, wait, that's all three of them. You know, mm. the holy one. Oh, wait, that's all three of them. Yeah. Um, in order to actually pick out one person, you can only do it by relating that person to another person. Mm. There's nothing I can say about the father. Because all the, all the divine attributes are true of all of them. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So you're going to, you could talk all day and say wonderful things about God, but never succeed in picking out the father mm. until you say, well, he's the father of the son, the, the, the principle or The distinction origin. is only relative to each other. Yep. When you put, yeah. w- like when you draw a circle on the board and say, okay, here's the father, um, and then you write things in it like almighty, you have to go, well, actually, yes, but almighty applies to all three of them. Mm. Right? Mm. But if you write, he has the attribute of fatherhood. Mm. Cool, that sticks and identifies only the father. But what you've done is you've smuggled in relation to the son. Because fatherhood's right. not like this abstract principle yeah, he has. Yeah, there's got to be a son for you to be a father. So he's, in the eternal life of the Trinity, the father, everything is from the father in that sense. The son is from the father. The spirit is in a different way from the father. Mm. Now, we, you know, there are technical terms. That, Eternally. Yep. Eternal there, there's, generation there's no, in the case of the son and eternal spiration yeah. in the case of the spirit. Yeah. And spirate's well, kind of this ugly English word that clearly we just got from... The Latin word for spirit. Now, the question I had is, that's probably a term that maybe someone has heard of an eternal generation vis-a-vis the sun, but spiration is this, sounds very foreign and odd and yeah. not something they were hearing in church very often. You could say, it's biblical to talk about the spirit being eternally breathed forth from the Father. Mm. Um, the spirit is the breath of God, and that's what spirit means, right? Yeah. Um, so how do, we, how do we hold to that very orthodox view yeah. and not fall into this idea of thinking that 
somehow the father made the spirit mm. or he's a creation in a certain sense. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So here's, here's the nice thing about that to know the father, of course, you only know him in relation to the son and the spirit and as the source of the son and spirit. And then the other thing that the father is the source of is like creation, right? Everything, mm. everything comes from God. Yeah. And in the creed we're, we learn to say, I believe in God, the father almighty maker of heaven and earth. But we don't mean that the Father alone made heaven and earth, because we also know the Son is the maker, and the Spirit is the maker. Mm -hmm. The one triune God is the maker of heaven and earth. What we're doing there, when we identify the Father as the maker, is we're doing a a technical move called appropriation, where we take something that is the work of the whole Trinity, creation, and we appropriate it to the Father specifically because it reminds us of the Father's personal identity in the Trinity. Mm. Just as the Son and the Spirit are from the Father— creation being from God reminds us of this fromness, right? And so we appropriate it. Now we don't all know we're doing that when we talk, we're just talking like the Bible and the creed. Yeah. When we yeah. say God, the father maker of heaven <laughs> and earth. But if I ask you, then I don't Socratic, think most Christians are saying I'm, I'm appropriating right there. I, that's right. I am, I am performing the <laughs> theological act of appropriation, <laughs> but it is in fact what we're doing. It's what the Bible is doing. Mm. Um, and you can get to that through, you know, I teach in the Tory Honors College, I teach Socratically all the time. And so I could ask Socratically when you... That just means it would be a question and answer. Question and answer, so yeah. Can you give an example of what that would be? Yep. So if you say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and I say, do you mean that the Son is not the maker of heaven and earth? Hmm. Like, I would... And your I'm, students are like, no, no. Ex- exactly, right? It's yeah. a leading question in the sense that I think you know the whole picture, and I think here's what you mean. Let me put that to you in question form. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So I've heard some Christians today, arguably following in the footsteps of someone like St. Augustine or others in church history, who will sort of want to define the Holy Spirit as the, the mutual love shared between the Father and the Son. And then they'll, they'll draw on certain passages of scripture that they would say kind of suggest that. Are you familiar with that view? And, and if so, how, how would you think about that? Is there merit to that way of conceiving of the Spirit? Yeah, there is there is merit to that. It, I think it's in the fact that the the Scripture presents the Holy Spirit third. I think third person of the Trinity, though it's obviously not a biblical phrase, is a, it really captures mm. something deep about how God instructs us about Father, Son, and Holy There's Spirit. There's a certain progression to how maybe we should even think about or learn about these persons. Yep. So even though it's true that when you think of the Father, you ought to also always think of the Son and Spirit. That's not self-evident in the name Father, right? Mm-hmm. And in fact, there's this kind of dyadic tendency to think of Father and Son. That's a pair that naturally goes together. The thing about the Spirit coming third is when you think about the Holy Spirit, it's obvious, it's evident that you must always also think of the Father and the Son, right? You've got mm-hmm. to think of who is the Holy Spirit. Well, he's the Spirit of the Father. He's the Spirit of the Son. He's the Spirit of the Father and the Son, mm. Right, And so yeah. it immediately draws you into, this is the great benefit of, of uh, teaching on the Holy Spirit, is it really lands the plane, right? Teaching on the Spirit really closes the loop and completes the teaching on the Trinity. Mm. In some sense, yeah. you draw the equilateral triangle, you know, and label the corners Father, Son, and Spirit, and it seems like you should be able to start anywhere and get a full yeah. teaching on the Trinity. Right. But in fact, in the order of Revelation, it's when you complete the story yeah. with reflection on the Spirit yeah. that the whole Trinitarian thing really comes alive yeah. for you. That's such an interesting, it connects to what you were saying before about just in, in some ways observing and acknowledging the validity of what Revelation is actually revealing about these persons and the order in which they're revealed and the extent to which they're revealed. Yeah. Uh, I think that's something that is, we can have our systematic categories and so we feel like each should receive the same uh, focus is maybe revealed as, as the same what to the same extent, but mm. it seems like you're you're kind of advocating for a certain respect for just the way God chose to reveal these things to us. Yep. I mean, obviously, I love systematic categories, and I'm going to draw that triangle. And yeah. I'm going to keep doing it, but there is there's a, value in that. There, oh yeah. Yep. Um, there is a false geometrization, though, uh-huh. of our way of organizing the thought. And what I mean is, once you draw the triangle, and it's helpful, but you can start to treat it as if, um, yeah, the three corners ought to be talked about in the same way. And Mm. in the sense that the Spirit is fully God and is not the Father or the Son, of course that's true. But you don't want to like take that triangular template and then start judging everybody using it. So, you know, if your pastor talks a lot about the Father and the Son in a sermon, you don't want to take out the triangle diagram and say, 
pastor, you neglected uh, uh, the uh, spirit. Uh, uh, take a concrete example of that. I, I know some people, for great reasons, will make a point to whenever they pray, they pray to all three persons of the Trinity, and mm-hmm. they want to m- make a point of emphasizing that every time. What do you think about that? Is that is that a, a good thing that you should always do, or is that uh, is that sort of falling into this trap? It yeah. it could be it could be falling into the trap of um, you know artificially sort of mm-hmm. geometricizing things or. Yeah, getting fooled into thinking that since Father, Son, and Spirit are all, you know, co-equally, co-eternally God, they should get the same amount of attention. Mm. Um, so there's nothing wrong with praying to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yeah. or, or the Father, or the Son, or the Holy Spirit. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the rule is you can pray to anyone who's God. But, well, that, that was another question. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard Christians make the case that, uh, I think it was a, a kind of an argument from Scripture itself, that it's maybe not appropriate to pray to the Holy Spirit. Well, here, so here's the thing about that. It is true that most biblical prayer is directed to the Father, and it is directed to the Father in the name of the Son. But there is also prayer to the Son in Scripture. In fact, some theologians would say the real test of your orthodoxy is, you know, do you believe Jesus is God? Then you will pray to him. Because mm. <laughs> yeah. if you just kind of like formally acknowledge yeah. he's God but won't pray to him. If you won't then, pray to him, what's that say? Exactly, yeah. yeah like. Yeah. I, th- I think um, often the, the people will point to maybe the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus explicitly instructs his followers, this is how you pray, yeah. and he prays to the Father. Yep, and that that is, if you want an A on the theological exam, like what is what is the direction of Christian prayer? It is to the Father, mm. in you know through the Son, in the Spirit. Mm. But notice, I used that phrase before, fr- everything is from the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. Yeah. That's the direction of God's work towards us. If you're talking about our response to God, empowered by God, then it's going to be to the Father, right? It's the reversal of from the Father. Yeah. Answering to from the Father, our access to God is to the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. Mm. Now, it's that in the Spirit part that you realize in the Spirit means that I might not be as actively aware of the Spirit, because the Spirit's neither the target I'm aiming at nor the means through which I get to it. Mm but the sort of environment or circumstance in which yeah. I aim at that target through that medium. And then the last thing to say is there just are no biblical examples of prayer to the Spirit. But you would say that doesn't mean that doesn't mean it's inappropriate to do so. That's right. That's, right. Where, so, our, that's where our, our systematic categories can help us um, keep straight, that no, yeah. this is God. You can pray to anyone who's God, and so yeah. that means you can pray to the Father, the Son, or the Spirit. And you can also pray to God in general, it's not like that's going to go to the dead letter office in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, you got just, the, the mailman in heaven saying, well, which person? I don't know where to send this. Yeah. I mean, you know, because I'm, I'm pretty extremely Trinitarian, but if I see something going wrong in traffic and I just suddenly hold my hand up and say, God, protect yeah. that person, um, you could freeze frame that, pull me out of it, you know, and ask me in detail, which person of the Trinity were you talking to when you yelled, God, help that person? I would say I, I was not having yeah. a... My, I was not having any conscious Trinitarian thoughts. And that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Yep. You, are having, you are talking personally to God. Yeah. Not because God is like, you know, four persons yeah. or something like that. Well, I think it's, it's helpful to emphasize because yeah. when, when you think of Trinitarian theology, often the emphasis is on the threeness. Yeah. But Trinitarian theology is also emphasizing the oneness. Yeah. I, I will say on prayer to the Spirit, you could take a very, I don't know if you call it fundamentalist, you could take a very literalist approach to this and say, since there is no prayer to the Spirit in Scripture, I will not pray to the Spirit. Mm. I think that's, a, that's overly tight. That's extreme. Uh, but I think, it's, I think it's Graham Cole who points this out, that broadly you want your prayer life to have the proportions of Scripture. And so if over the course of time you want to On a pray, number of fronts, probably. On a number of fronts, yeah. But on a Trinitarian front, you'd want to say, you should mostly pray to the Father, um, and mm. you should sometimes pray to the Son, and you should... Not that often, pray to the Holy Spirit. And mm. when you do pray to the Spirit, you should probably do it in a more formal context where you're doing something like in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, yeah. where you've got kind of a you know, a liturgical or an elaborate setting in which all these things are made present yeah. somehow. Yeah, all three persons are, yeah. are... Though that doesn't rule out just like asking the Holy yeah. Spirit to you know, be present with us. Yeah, so yeah. that's something that you know, families listening tonight, you could... Feel free to pray to the Spirit tonight over over dinner. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you want to have your eye on the big picture, though. Is overall, am I praying to God mm. in Scripture proportions? Yeah, that's so good. I would say it would probably be wrong in some way to pray exclusively to the Holy Spirit as the main staple of your prayer diet. Yeah. I would just say, yeah. if you're not choosing to follow Scripture's proportions, yeah. what 
proportions are you choosing to follow? Where are you getting that and why? That's good. Uh, maybe a few other common questions about the spirit that I think come up that I'm sure you, you get asked often. What does it mean to be indwelled by the spirit? Uh, it's, a, it's a phrase that we throw out a lot. And I think all of us have a maybe a vague sense. And there's probably even certain traditions within Christianity that have a more uh, specific understanding of what that would look like or mean. Yeah. But how do you see that, that phrase? I, I take the basic idea of indwelling of the Spirit to be synonymous with salvation. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a matter of intimate communion with God that's happening at the, at the deepest level, you know, at the level of union. As the Puritans would distinguish between union and communion. Mm. Union is like the, the foundation of you being united to God through the work of God. Communion is actually your devotional life and like, did you pray or are you feeling the presence of God? Yeah. So would you connect the idea with the indwelling of the Spirit in a systematic way with this concept of union with Christ? Yes. Are those, mm-hmm. those are kind of uh, both speaking about the same thing? Those are, yeah, very close. Uh, the, the same thing, I mean, maybe under different aspects. Mm. So we could distinguish truths about them, but they're pointing to the same kind of saving. What are some of the most common misunderstandings of the indwelling of the Spirit that you've encountered? Well, to put it off in a subsequent way, to, uh, as, if, as if we have such a thing as salvation, and then later on you add to it this expansion pack mm. of being filled by the Holy <laughs> Spirit. That I, I had a Pentecostal upbringing and am very comfortable in charismatic circles, though I am not Pentecostal or charismatic. Yeah. And there can be a tendency there to sort of misspeak and make it sound like phase one of the Christian life is spirit-free. Phase two that you can like trade up to or add on is yeah. spirit-filled. Hmm. And I think, well... I understand why people talk like that, because thank God there are these breakthrough moments in Christian experience yeah. where your eyes are reopened yeah. and you understand something. And I mean, I got saved at about age 16, and about a year later, I came to a new understanding of grace that was so earth-shaking that yeah. I looked back on my past year and thought, have I actually been Christian? Like, if I hmm. if I didn't understand what I now understand 12 months later, did did my so-called conversion really count? Because, man, I didn't know anything. Then a year, you know, a year later, it happened again, and I thought, I'm not sure I've been a Christian the last <laughs> two years. After a while, you start to realize, wait, maybe you just grow in your understanding. Yeah. So there are these moments when the Spirit... Through his through the word and, yeah. and other things can reveal things to us in yeah. a in a powerful way. Yep, there's a moment of intimacy and nearness that throws a whole new light on everything you've been doing that makes yeah. you think in retrospect, I was doing the right thing, but going through the motions, and but now I get it. Um, and so people want to call that like, maybe that was the baptism in the spirit. Maybe that was the real indwelling of the spirit. Maybe yeah. that was. And so I think a lot of times people will mislabel that and sort of yeah. grab a biblical phrase and apply it. Something. So it's, so it's not about diminishing that real experience that we can have, uh, but it's just saying that's not, that's not what Scripture means when it says we're indwelt. Yeah. Uh, I think one other question about indwelling uh, that people often wonder about is, is there a physical, local sense to that where like, oh, the Spirit is in me, he's, he's in my heart, and he's indwelling me, like he's actually, is there a physical dynamic or a, a geographic dimension to it, or is that pushing the metaphor too far? Yeah, I I um I think it's pushing the metaphor too far. I, d- I don't think God changes location, mm. right? Yeah, <laughs> um, he's kind of everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the same rules would apply there as when you think about the presence of God in the spirit uh, in the temple, mm. right? So in what way is the God of Israel present in the temple? You don't want to say that he, you know, physically changed location, that he went from heaven yeah. to earth in such a way that he stopped being in heaven and instead crossed a span of space and took up residence. Yeah, yeah. right. That, that's not happening. But there was a sense in which the, the temple, say the Holy of Holies, was a unique physical space that manifested his presence differently. Oh, yeah. It would be silly to turn away from the temple and look up into the sky and say, like, ah, oh, the omnipresence of God yeah. is just as great there right. as in the temple. There's a particular covenantal, intentional presence and manifestation there that, you know, you can't just explain away by appealing to divine omnipresence omnipresence. Yes, yes. Another topic related to the Spirit that can be quite, quite controversial are the gifts of the Spirit uh, mentioned in passages like 1 Corinthians 12. And different Christians will understand these in different ways. But broadly speaking, how do you understand this concept of spiritual gifts? Yeah, the, so the, I want to connect this to the other thing I wanted to say about the indwelling of the Spirit, and that is that it's different on the two sides of the covenantal a continental uh, divide. <laughs> yeah. In the Old Covenant, the Spirit of the Lord is active among his people, 
and even seem even it seems to be at work in the people of God yeah. in particular ways. But you know, there are standard limitations you put on it. Like um, seems to be in many ways episodic and focused more on leaders appointed for a purpose. Yeah, we, right. You know, we could kind of walk through the biblical Read stories of David. Yep, but that in the New Testament, um, there's an indwelling of the Spirit, sort of on a permanent foundation. Um, there are various ways we could talk about that, but the clear, you know, the main things and the plain things here, the clear thing is, well, of course, the new covenant indwelling of the Spirit is on the basis of the finished work of the atonement, mm-hmm. right? So that the, the work of the Son is accomplished, and the result of that is the indwelling of the Spirit in a new covenant way. Mm. Yeah. Now, there, are, you know, there's a range of opinions on that, and it always comes down to, it, it seems to come down to proportions, right? Like, how much was the Spirit in the people of God in the old, under the old covenant? Yeah. And how much... I would I would use the language of permanent and sort of you know covenantal indwelling mm. on the basis of the finished work. It's normative for Christians the New Testament, yeah, the New Covenant, yeah, yeah. and it's the subject of teaching. So that's the foundation for me mm. for talking about the gifts of the Spirit in uh, in the letters of Paul. Right, mm. is where you mainly get this teaching about a special a special equipping that the risen Lord gives His people in His church to carry out the works of ministry. Mm. So these are gifts from Christ, Mm -hmm. that's how Scripture speaks of it, but they're in some way empowered or enabled through the Spirit? Yeah, and they are they are acting out a fellowship in the Holy Spirit yeah. for the building up of the body of Christ. So there are three major blocks of teaching on spiritual gifts in the New Testament, and I tend to take Ephesians 4 as the foundational one. Okay. Do, do you view the, the list of spiritual gifts that we see in the New Testament as kind of exhaustive? And this is... This is the list. So yeah, now take your spiritual gifts inventory test <laughs> right. and you'll know which ones you have. Or is it representative and there's sort of, it's not, not as locked in as you might make it out to be? Yep. I, that's a good question. I, I take it to be, not, uh, to be representative rather than exhaustive. Mm. I think that your spiritual gift, your particular spiritual gifting yeah. emerges in the context of congregational push and pull, you mm. know, where you figure out what you're good at, you know, how does it align with your natural gifts? Where does it cross purposes with your natural gifts? Mm. And you're sort of like out beyond what you could do on your own, but God blesses it for the benefit of others. I don't think, I'm not a big believer in um, uh, spiritual gifts inventories. <laughs> you know, I've used them, uh, I've taken them, and I've even administered them in various church settings. Um, but I just take them as a starting point for like yeah. getting some categories out there so you can start to be alert to right. how God uses you to build up others. But really the best way to... to- the best way to understand your spiritual gifts would be just get plugged into a local church, yep. start serving. Yep. Uh, maybe a, a final question, uh, maybe one of the, the most common questions I'm sure that you hear about the Holy Spirit. What is the unforgivable sin of blasphemy against the Spirit that Jesus warns us against in Matthew 12? Yeah, that's a great question. And the, the main right way to answer that is to like open up to Matthew 12 and like to, to go to yeah. those passages and really check Walk that in context. Them. Yeah. Because there is something about the ministry of Jesus Christ at the point that it is Mm. in his conflict with the Pharisees that is really important there in Matthew in particular. Mm. But it's sort of at the broad systematic level, I think what's going on with that, you know, really strong language. Well, and the reason we ask the question is because it seems like the rest of Scripture speaks about sin as always forgivable. In Christ, through faith, we can always be forgiven no matter what we've done. And yet there's this one spot where Jesus, you know, utters these words of unforgivable sin yeah. that can be a little uh, scary sounding because we're just, it's so category breaking for us. Yep. And, and even there, I mean, Jesus says, you know, all, all sins can be forgiven. Right. You even know, he makes e- that Even contrast. blasphemy. Yep. <laughs> even blasphemy but, but, against the son, but, but not. not against the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus himself recapitulates the main teaching of scripture when he then goes on to make this exception, which by the way is the. This is the only place where uh, the Son and the Spirit are contrasted to each other mm, in the teaching distinct. of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So it, it's a fascinating passage. And, and he's elevating the Spirit in a sense. He's mm-hmm. saying he's very important, you yeah. know. Um, and I, the last thing I want to say before I give my answer to this <laughs> is that um, it is a haunting passage, and it can be sort of weaponized, I think, against doubting Christians. Doubting Christians can self-weaponize it yeah, against themselves. Yeah, they worry that they've done this. We bought a cabinet one time, a little metal cabinet that goes in a workshop, and um, you know, I, I had it in my, in my uh, workshop uh, in the garage for a while. When you open the front door, inside of it, someone had written, um, unforgivable sin, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, wow. and a Bible verse. Wow. And I thought, it just is this haunting thing where I think, some guy had this in his workshop yeah. and wrote this in there. You know, did was he write worried it? about it? Wanted to remember. Did he write it because he thought he'd 
committed it and he wrote it in a, inside of a cabinet in the basement or was he just thinking about yeah. it or was it on the radio? I, I don't know, but it makes you... That's, it's heavy. Yeah, yeah. The, the depth, uh, uh, the, you know, the heaviness of this, yeah. the way this guy, this guy I never met <laughs> must yeah. have pondered it. Yeah. Here's what I think is going on. I, th- I, think, I think you're right to point out that it sort of elevates the spirit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it makes the spirit, it picks out the spirit as special. Like yeah. You can even blaspheme Jesus and that can be forgiven. That's very bad, but that can be forgiven, but not this. This gets to the uh, place of the Holy Spirit in the divine life. Remember that everything is from the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. And in there has that sense of finalized, perfected, consummated, completed. Mm. So that when you get to the work of the Holy Spirit, um, that's where it all pays off. You know, That's where everything from the Father and everything through the Son comes to rest in the Holy Spirit. And there's some kind of finality there that I think Jesus is picking out mm. about the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I, I think that's what's going on there in the idea that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is unforgivable. It's not so much that there's this one act that you can commit. I think that's probably a question people have is, yeah. what would it look like for me to blaspheme the Holy Spirit right. so I can avoid it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, and, or on the other side, there's this um, really sad phenomenon a few years ago of people with a Christian upbringing deconverting oh, and, and then, making YouTube videos of themselves saying the phrase, yeah. you know, I do hereby commit the blasphemy yeah. and saying a bunch of bad things about yeah. the Holy Spirit yeah. so that they could have it on YouTube so that they could prove that they were utterly unredeemable, they yeah. had no chance. With those people, I think like they should not do that, but I also think you did not succeed there mm. in committing an act that God himself cannot undo, yeah. you know, cannot forgive you. Yeah. Instead, it's talking about a, you know, a state of when all is said and done, when all everything from the Father and through the Son mm. has come to rest in the Spirit, and to blaspheme that. There is something final about that. Mm. The other thing I think it gets to is when we confess Christ, we're not just, we are not doing that just in the gumption of our own effort. We are seeing Christ as who he is and confessing who he is. Yeah. And we are doing that by divine power. That is to say, we're doing that in the Holy Spirit. Paul says in another context, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Mm. So if the Spirit is the very one through whom we can make saving confession of who Christ is, then what do you say about blaspheming that one, right? You're sort of, you're backing out of your own confession and cutting out the ground under your own feet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for the Christian listening right now who who would say, uh, sincerely, I I trust in Christ. I believe in his finished work. I'm seeking to honor God. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I sin all the time. Do they need to worry about accidentally or falling prey to this sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit? I, I don't think they do. Um, I think, especially if they're thinking of it as an event or as a, an, action an action they can take. Or something they yep. say. Yep. I think that what's happening there, I'm convinced it's a form of spiritual warfare where mm. Satan is bringing to mind whatever random Bible verse he can lay hold of for this agenda of undermining your confidence. Mm. I, I really think. You see it in a work like um, Bunyan's. He just goes through one tormenting doubt after another. And as soon as someone explains a Bible verse to him, he just finds another one, uh, and he finds this one, and he finds whatever yeah. whatever verse will do to undermine his confidence. Mm, that's that's so helpful, uh, Fred. Thank you so much for taking the time to to help. I think all of us perhaps understand the spirit a little bit more, and more importantly, appreciate him and his work in our lives. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. That was Fred Sanders on common questions about the Holy Spirit. For more, be sure to check out his book with Crossway, The Holy Spirit, An Introduction. Pick up your copy of the print edition for 30% off or get the ebook for 50% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org plus. That's crossway.org plus. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review. That really helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's Word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.